After my marriage, I lived with my wife in another part of London. My friend Sherlock Holmes continued to live in his apartment in Baker Street. One day, in the autumn of 1890, I decided to visit my friend. But when I arrived at his apartment, I found he already had a visitor. This visitor was an old man. He was fat with a red face. But the most unusual thing about him was his hair. The colour of the old man's hair was bright red. I'm sorry, Holmes, I said. I didn't know you were busy. I'll wait in the next room. But Holmes didn't want me to leave. He pulled me into the room and closed the door. This is my friend Dr. Watson, he said to the old man. Dr. Watson has helped me with many cases. Perhaps he can also help me with yours. I'm very interested in your cases, Holmes, I said. This is Mr. Jabez Wilson, went on Holmes. The old man nodded to me. Mr. Wilson has come to me with a very unusual story. It's the most interesting problem I've heard for a long time. Mr. Wilson, could you please tell your story again from the beginning? I'd like Dr. Watson to hear it. Mr. Wilson pulled an old newspaper out of his pocket. He opened the paper on his knees and turned to the advertisement page. He ran his finger down the advertisements and pointed to one of them. Here, he said, this is how everything began. Read it for yourself, Dr. Watson. I took the newspaper from Mr. Wilson. It was the Morning Chronicle and was two months old. I read the advertisement. The Red-Headed League Another vacancy is open for someone wishing to become a member of the League. Salary? Four pounds a week. All red-headed men over 21 years old should come on Monday at 11 a.m. to this address. Duncan Ross, The Red-Headed League, 7 Pope's Court, Fleet Street, London. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. What a strange advertisement, I said. Whatever can it mean? Holmes laughed. <laughs> it's very unusual, isn't it? He said. And now, Mr. Wilson, tell us your story. Well, began Mr. Wilson, I have a small shop in Saxe-Coburg Square in the City of London. But business hasn't been good for some time, and I don't make much money any more. I used to have two assistants, but now I can only pay one. My assistant is very interested in learning the business, so he's willing to work for half pay. That's very unusual, said Holmes. What's the name of your assistant? Vincent Spaulding, replied Mr. Wilson. He's an excellent assistant, but he does do one unusual thing. Spaulding's very interested in photography and takes a lot of photographs. He develops these photographs himself in the cellar of my shop. When he isn't working, he spends all his time down there. Go on, said Holmes. We live very quietly, continued Mr. Wilson. I don't go out very much, and I don't read the newspapers. One day, eight weeks ago, Spaulding came to me with a newspaper in his hand. It was the same newspaper that I showed you, Dr. Watson. Mr. Wilson, said Spaulding, I wish I were a red-headed man. Why? I asked in surprise. Well, here's another vacancy in the Red-Headed League, replied Spaulding. The Red-Headed League, I asked. What's that? Spaulding looked at me and laughed. Haven't you ever heard of the Red-Headed League, he said? You could become a member and make a lot of money. Well, when I heard that, said Mr. Wilson, at once I became very interested. I needed more money, so I asked Spaulding to tell me more about this Red-Headed League. I think, said Spaulding, the League was started by an American called Ezekiah Hopkins. Ezekiah Hopkins was a very rich man, and enjoyed doing unusual things. Hopkins was red-headed himself, and liked all other red-headed men. So when he died, he left his money in his will to help red-headed men. The money was used to start the Red-Headed League. 
when a man became a member, he would be paid an excellent salary for very little work. And now, said Spalding, showing me the advertisement again, here's another vacancy in the league. Why don't you go to Pope's Court, Mr. Wilson? I'm sure you could become a member. Now, as you see, gentlemen, continued Mr. Wilson, the colour of my hair is bright red, so I thought I could easily become a member of this red-headed league. Vincent Spalding seemed to know a lot about the league, so I asked him to come with me to the address in the advertisement. We closed the shop for the day and set off for Pope's Court, Fleet Street. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Holmes rubbed his hands together and smiled. Your story is very interesting, Mr. Wilson, he said. Please go on. When we arrived in Fleet Street, said Mr. Wilson, we saw a strange thing. The whole street was full of red-headed men. They had all come to answer the advertisement. When I saw how many men were waiting, I wanted to go home. But Spalding wouldn't let me. He pushed and pulled me through the crowd. At last we reached the stairs leading up to the office in Pope's Court. A small man was sitting behind a table. The colour of this man's hair was a brighter red than my own. This is Mr. Jabez Wilson, said my assistant. He has come about the vacancy in the league. The small man looked carefully at my hair. He looked at it for such a long time that I began to feel uncomfortable. Suddenly he bent forward and grabbed my hair with both hands. He pulled at it until I cried out in pain. I'm sorry I hurt you, said the man. Your hair is a wonderful colour, but I had to make sure you weren't wearing a wig. I had to find out if your hair was real. Then he went over to the window. He opened it and shouted down to the men below that the vacancy was taken. The red-headed men groaned with disappointment. Then they began to walk away. In a few minutes, the square was empty. My name, said the small man, is Duncan Ross. You are now a member of the Red-Headed League. When can you start the job? Well, that's going to be difficult, I replied. I have a business already. Oh, don't worry about that, Mr. Wilson, cried Spalding. I can look after the business for you. Now, I knew that my assistant was a good worker and would look after my business well. So I asked Duncan Ross, what are the hours of work? Every day between the hours of ten o'clock and two o'clock, replied Mr. Ross. The pay is four pounds a week. But you must not leave the office at any time between ten and two. If you leave for any reason, you'll lose your pay. I understand, I said. And what is the work? Copying out the Encyclopedia Britannica. The first book of it is over there. Will you be able to start work tomorrow? Certainly, I said. Then goodbye, Mr. Wilson. I hope you enjoy your work. I went home with Vincent Spalding. I was very pleased. It was an easy job to copy out the Encyclopedia Britannica, and the pay was excellent. Next morning, when I arrived at the office, Duncan Ross was waiting for me. I started copying out the encyclopedia, beginning with subjects under the letter A. Sometimes Mr. Ross left the room, but he kept coming back to see me. At two o'clock he told me I had worked well, he was very pleased, then I left and he locked the office door behind me. The same thing happened every day for eight weeks. Every morning I began work at ten, and every afternoon I left at two. Every Saturday I was given four pounds for my week's work. At first Mr. Ross came into the office to watch me work, but after a time he stopped coming. However, I was afraid to leave the office. I didn't want to lose my pay. But suddenly everything came to an end. To an end? asked Holmes. Yes. This morning I went to work as usual at ten o'clock, but the door was locked and on it was this card. Mr. Wilson held up a small piece of white card. This is what it said. The Red-Headed League is finished. The 9th of October, 1890. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. 
You can look at it once more if you want. Holmes and I looked at the piece of white card. Then we looked at Mr. Wilson's face. He looked very disappointed and upset. But there was also something rather funny about the red-headed league. Suddenly, we both began to laugh. I don't think this is funny, cried Mr. Wilson angrily. Perhaps I should take my case somewhere else. No, no, <laughs> said Holmes. Your case is most interesting and unusual. What did you do when you found the card on the door? I was extremely surprised, replied Mr. Wilson. I didn't know what to do. I went to all the offices in the building. I asked if anyone knew anything about the Red-Headed League, but no one had ever heard of Duncan Ross. At last, I went home to Saxe-Coburg Square. I told Vincent Spaulding what had happened. Spaulding said that if I waited, perhaps the League would write to me. Perhaps they would explain everything in a letter. But I didn't want to wait. I've lost a good salary of four pounds a week. I want to find out about this League and why they did this to me. Mr. Holmes, I've heard you help people when they are in trouble. That's why I've come to you. You've done the right thing, said Holmes. I'll be happy to help you, Mr. Wilson. But first, I want to ask you some questions. Your assistant, Vincent Spaulding, how long had he been with you before he saw the advertisement? About a month. How did he get the job as your assistant? I advertised the vacancy for an assistant. He came for the job. I chose him because he looked a good worker. Also, he said that he would work for half pay. What does Spaulding look like? He's small and he moves very quickly. He's about thirty years old and has a white mark on his forehead. Holmes sat up straight in his chair. He was very excited. Tell me, he said, is there anything unusual about Vincent Spaulding's ears? Yes, replied Mr. Wilson. They have holes in them for earrings. He told me a gypsy did this when he was a boy. Holmes sat back in his chair. He was thinking carefully. I guessed Holmes already knew something about Vincent Spaulding. Is Spaulding still working for you? asked Holmes. Yes, said Mr. Wilson. I've left him at the shop. Good. Mr. Wilson, I need a couple of days to investigate this case. I hope to solve the mystery by Monday. After Mr. Wilson had left, Holmes turned to me. Well, Watson, he said, what do you think about all this? I can't understand it, I said. It's most unusual. I need to think, said Holmes. Please don't speak to me for at least fifty minutes. I'm going to smoke my pipe. Holmes sat back in his chair. He put his black pipe between his lips, lit it, and closed his eyes. Time passed. I thought Holmes had fallen asleep, but suddenly Holmes jumped out of his chair and put his pipe down on the table. Watson, he said, we're going to visit Saxe-Coburg Square. Come, quickly. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. We soon arrived in Saxe-Coburg Square, the place where Mr. Wilson had his shop. Saxe-Coburg Square was in a poor part of London. It was a small and quiet square. On each side of the square stood a line of old houses. In the middle of the square was a small garden with grass. Sherlock Holmes stopped outside one of the houses on the corner of the square. On the wall of this house there was a brown notice with the words Jabez Wilson in white letters. Holmes walked up and down and examined all the houses carefully. Then he returned to Mr. Wilson's house. Suddenly he hit the pavement outside the house with his stick. Then he went up to the house and knocked on the door. Immediately it was opened by a young man. This was Mr. Wilson's assistant, Vincent Spaulding. Excuse me, said Holmes. Can you please tell me the way to the Strand? Go down the third street on the right, answered the assistant quickly. Then he closed the door. That's a very clever young man, said Holmes, as we walked away.
I know something about him. I believe he's the fourth cleverest man in London. It is clear, I said, that Mr. Wilson's assistant plays an important part in the mystery of the Red Headed League. Did you ask the way to the Strand in order to get a look at him? No, said Holmes. But I wanted to look at the knees of his trousers. The knees of his trousers? I cried in astonishment. Well, then, Holmes, why did you hit the pavement? Watson, said Holmes, we haven't time to talk now. We've seen the front of Saxe Coburg Square. Let's now investigate the street at the back. We went round the corner and walked to the street at the back of Mr. Wilson's shop. We were immediately in one of the busiest and most important streets in the city of London. A line of expensive shops and important businesses were on the side of the road. Hundreds of people were hurrying along the pavements, and the roadway was busy with traffic. It was hard to believe that Saxe Coburg Square, with its poor old houses, was immediately behind the important buildings of this busy street. Holmes looked along the line of buildings. This is very interesting, Watson, said Holmes. There's a tobacconist, a newspaper shop, a restaurant, and. Ah, yes! The offices of the City and Suburban Bank. I could see that Holmes was very excited. Well, Watson, I have some work to do that will take a few hours, went on Holmes. This case at Saxe Coburg Square is serious. Serious? I said. Why? An important crime has been planned. I think we'll be in time to stop it, but I'll need your help tonight. At what time? Ten o'clock. Then I'll be at your apartment at ten. Good. And Watson, there may be some danger, so please bring your gun with you. I said good bye and went home. I thought about everything that had happened. It was a very strange case, and I did not understand what was happening. Where were we going that evening? What were we going to do? Why did I have to bring my gun? And who was Vincent Spaulding? There was only one thing to do. I had to wait until the evening. Then perhaps I would get the answers to these questions. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. At quarter past nine that evening, I set off for Baker Street, where Holmes lived. When I arrived, I noticed two carriages standing outside Holmes' door. Inside his apartment, Holmes was talking with two men. One of them was Peter Jones, a police detective. The other man was tall and thin, with a sad looking face. Hello, Watson, said Holmes. I think you already know Mr. Jones of Scotland Yard. Let me introduce Mr. Merriweather. Mr. Merriweather is also coming with us tonight. I hope it's important, said Mr. Merriweather sadly. I usually play cards with friends on Saturday evenings. I have played cards every Saturday night for the last twenty seven years. I think, said Sherlock Holmes, that tonight you'll play a more exciting game than cards. You, Mr. Merriweather, may lose thirty thousand pounds. You, Jones, may win the prize of a criminal you want to catch. The criminal John Clay, murderer and thief, said Jones. He's a young man, but he's a very clever criminal. I want to catch him more than any criminal in London. It's time to go now, said Holmes. Two carriages are waiting. You two take the first carriage, and Watson and I will follow in the second. The carriages went quickly through the dark streets. I wondered where we were going. We're nearly there, Holmes said to me at last. This man, Merriweather, is a bank manager. I wanted Jones to come with us too. He's a good man. He's not very clever, but he is very brave. Ah. Here we are. We were in the same busy street which Holmes and I had visited earlier in the day. We got out of the carriages, and Mr. Merriweather took us down to a small side door. Through the door was a corridor with an iron gate at the end. Mr. Merriweather opened this gate and stopped to light a lantern. Then he took us down some steps and through another gate. At last, we were in a large cellar. This cellar was full of large boxes. Holmes took out his magnifying glass and went down on his knees to the floor. He examined the stones on the floor, then he jumped up 
and put the glass back in his pocket. We have about an hour, he said. The criminals will wait until Mr. Wilson is in bed. Then they'll move quickly. Watson, we're in the cellar of one of the most important banks in London. Mr. Merriweather is the manager of this bank. He'll explain why the criminals are interested in this cellar at the moment. About two months ago, whispered Mr. Merriweather, the bank received a huge amount of gold from the Bank of France, but we never used the money. It's still lying in boxes in this cellar. I understand, I said. Well, said Holmes, let's make our plans. Mr. Merriweather, you must put out the lantern. But first, we must decide where to stand. These men are dangerous, and we must move carefully. I want you all to hide behind these boxes. When I shine my light on the men, attack them. If they fire a gun, Watson, shoot back at once. I hid behind a wooden box and put my gun on the top. Merriweather put out the lantern, and we were in complete darkness. They have only one way of escape, whispered Holmes. That's back through Wilson's shop, into Saxe-Coburg Square. Have you done what I asked you, Jones? Three police officers are waiting at the front door of Wilson's shop, replied Jones. Excellent. Then everything is ready. And now we must be silent and wait. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. More than an hour went by. My arms and legs were tired, but I was afraid to move. The only sound was the breathing of my three companions. Suddenly, I saw a light. This light was coming from underneath the floor. It was shining between the stones in the floor. Slowly, one of the large stones turned over on its side. There was now a large square hole in the floor. The light of a lantern shone up through this hole. I saw a face appear in the hole. By the light of the lantern, I recognised Mr. Wilson's assistant. The young man pulled himself up out of the hole. He turned round and stood beside the hole. Then he began to pull up another man after him. This man was thin and small, with bright red hair. Let's hurry, whispered the young man. Suddenly, Holmes jumped forward and grabbed the young man by the neck. Immediately... The man with red hair jumped down the hole again. Jones grabbed at his coat, and I heard the sound of tearing cloth. At once the young man pulled a gun out of his pocket, but Holmes hit the man's hand, and the gun fell to the floor. "'Stand still, John Clay,' said Holmes. "'You cannot escape.' "'All right,' replied the young man. "'But I think my friend has escaped.' "'You'll see your friend very soon.' said Jones. There are three policemen waiting for him at the front door. Now then, John Clay, please hold out your hands. I'm going to take you to the police station. Jones put the handcuffs on John Clay's wrists, then led him upstairs. Holmes, Mr. Merriweather and I followed them from the cellar. Mr. Holmes, said Mr. Merriweather, I don't know how the bank can thank you. You've stopped a very serious crime. Well, replied Holmes, I've wanted to catch John Clay for a long time, and this has been a very interesting case. I enjoyed hearing the strange story of the Red-Headed League. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Later... Holmes explained to me the mystery of the Red-Headed League. "'You see, Watson,' he said, "'it was clear that the men in the Red-Headed League wanted only one thing. "'They wanted to get Mr. Wilson out of his shop for some hours every day. "'That was why they kept him busy copying out the Encyclopaedia Britannica. "'John Clay is a very clever young man. "'It was he who thought of the Red-Headed League.' He thought of it because Mr. Wilson's hair was the same colour as his friend's hair, very bright red. Clay put the advertisement in the newspaper, 
Then he showed the advertisement to Mr. Wilson. He suggested to Mr. Wilson that he should apply for the vacancy in the league. When Mr. Wilson told us that his assistant was working for half pay, I knew he must have a special reason for wanting the job. But Holmes, I said, how could you know what that reason was? Mr. Wilson's business is small, explained Holmes. There was nothing inside his house to attract criminals, so I knew it must be something outside the house. What could it be? Mr. Wilson told us that Vincent Spaulding, or John Clay, spent many hours in the cellar. The cellar. He was doing something in the cellar. I asked more questions about Vincent Spaulding. I found out that he was John Clay, one of London's most dangerous criminals. What could John Clay want in Wilson's cellar? I could think of only one answer. He must be digging a tunnel to another building. Then we visited Saxe-Coburg Square, and I surprised you by knocking on the pavement with my stick. I wanted to find out exactly where the cellar was. I knew from the sound my stick made that there was no cellar in front of the house. Then I rang the doorbell, and Clay answered it. I saw that the knees of his trousers were dirty. Clearly he had been digging for many hours. But what was he digging for? I walked round the corner, saw the city and suburban bank, and knew that I had solved the problem. When you went home, I visited Jones and Mr. Merriweather and asked them to come with us tonight. How did you know the criminals would try to rob the bank tonight? I asked. When they closed the red-headed league office, said Holmes, I knew the tunnel was finished. The criminals were ready to move. Today is Saturday. No one would come to the bank until Monday. If they took the gold tonight, they would have two days for their escape. Excellent, Holmes, I cried. You have been very clever. You have solved another difficult case. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. Mr. Wilson was a very rich man, but he had no children. When he died, he left his house and his money to his nephew, Mr. Humphreys. Mr. Humphreys was surprised because he had never met his uncle, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Humphreys left his job in an office. He went to live in his new house in the country. Mr. Humphreys was shown round the house by Mr. Cooper. Mr. Cooper was the estate manager. His job was to look after the house and gardens. It's a fine house, Mr. Humphreys, said Cooper. We all hope you'll be very happy here. The gardens are beautiful. I hope you like gardens, Mr. Humphreys. Yes, I do said Humphreys, very much. Mr. Wilson's grandfather started the gardens in 1780, Cooper said. The old gentleman went to Italy and came back with some strange ideas. Humphreys looked across the garden. I see there is a Roman temple, he said. Yes, sir, there is, said Cooper. Shall we go and look at it? The two men walked through the beautiful large gardens. There were many paths, with trees and bushes on either side. The Roman temple was on top of a small hill. There was a pile of stone blocks inside the temple. What are these stone blocks for? Humphreys asked. I don't know, sir, said Cooper. They came out of the maze. The maze, said Humphreys. I didn't know there was a maze in the gardens. Did Mr. Wilson make it? No, he didn't, sir, said Cooper. Mr. Wilson's grandfather planted the trees for the maze. Mr. Wilson never went in there. He didn't let anyone else go in either. Twenty years ago, Mr. Wilson gave orders for these stones to be taken out of the maze. Then the gate to the maze was locked. No one has been in there since. Mr. Humphreys looked at the stone blocks. Each one had a letter cut into it. 
How interesting, he said. I want to look at this maze. It's over there, sir, said Cooper, pointing to a small wood. There's a wall around it and the gate's locked. I'll go to the house and get the key. Cooper went back to the house. Humphreys walked to the small wood. He found a wall with a gate. The gate was locked with an old padlock. Above the gate was some writing in Latin. Secretum meum mihi et filius domus mei. Let me see, Humphreys said. That means something like, My secret is for me and for the sons of my house. Well, I'm a son of the house. The secret is mine, too. He kicked the old padlock. It broke and fell to the ground. He opened the gate and went into the maze. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. A dark path led into the maze. Inside, paths ran between thick hedges of tall yew trees. It was difficult to walk along the paths. The branches of the trees had grown across the paths. They almost blocked the way. Humphreys was the first person to walk in the maze for twenty years. He walked to the centre of the maze without getting lost. This is too easy, he said to himself. A maze is a puzzle. People always get lost in a maze. A stone column stood in the centre of the maze. It was about four feet high. On top of the column there was a metal globe. There were drawings and writing on the globe. It was dark and hot in the maze. There was no wind. There was a strange silence. Humphreys noticed that the birds had stopped singing. He turned to go. Then he heard something moving in the maze behind him. He looked around. He was suddenly afraid. He thought that someone was watching him. Ah, oh, there you are, said Cooper, coming round a corner. I followed your footprints in the dead leaves. I see you didn't need the key. Humphreys was pleased to see Cooper. He thought he was going to see someone or something else. The two men walked back to the house. Can you ask the gardeners to clear the paths? said Humphreys. Tell me, why did Mr. Wilson close the maze? I'm not sure, sir, Cooper replied. Mr. Wilson didn't like his grandfather, old Mr. Wilson, the one who planted the maze. He burnt all his grandfather's books. Perhaps that is why he closed the maze. What do you know about old Mr. Wilson? Humphreys asked. Not much, sir, said Cooper. He's been dead for fifty years. No one knows where he's buried. He had an Italian servant. The Italian servant buried his master at night. He was buried somewhere here in the gardens, but the grave has never been found. How very strange, said Humphreys. Mr. Humphreys went back to the house. A letter was waiting for him. Bentley Manor, the 14th of August, 1880. Dear Mr. Humphreys, You don't know me, but I am your neighbour. I am writing a book on English gardens. May I visit your garden? I am interested in the maze. I asked your uncle many times to let me see the maze, but he never let me see it. I hope you will let me see it. Also, I'd like to have a plan of the maze. I hope this is possible. Your neighbour, Lady Wardrop. Mr. Humphreys immediately replied to Lady Wardrop's letter. He invited her to visit the gardens the next day. He promised to give her a plan of the maze. I shall draw a plan tomorrow morning, he said to himself. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. He spent the evening in the library. There were thousands of books. He saw a very thin book on a high shelf. It was called The Secret of the Maze. He took the book to his bedroom. He wanted to read it before he fell asleep. He looked out of the bedroom window. There was a bright moon in the sky. The gardens were beautiful in the moonlight. White moonlight shone on the Roman temple. There was a red light in the maze. Something was burning. Of course, Humphrey said to himself, the gardener's cleared leaves from the paths of the maze this afternoon. 
They lit a fire to burn all the dead wood and leaves. The fire is still burning. There was one strange thing Mr. Humphreys did not like about the gardens. There was one yew tree growing alone. It stood halfway between the maze and the house. I haven't seen that tree before, Humphreys said. It's in a strange place. I will tell the gardeners to cut it down. Then he started to read the small book called The Secret of the Maze. There was a story in the book about a maze. The story happened many, many years ago. The maze was in a strange land. At the centre of the maze there was a red jewel. The jewel was very valuable. Many men tried to find the jewel. Many men went into the maze, but no one ever came out again. One day a traveller went into the maze. He saw the pathways clearly. The sun was shining. The traveller found the centre of the maze by the end of the day. The red jewel was at the centre of the maze. The jewel was the colour of fire. A voice spoke to the traveller. You have learned the secret of the maze. A doorway opened to a beautiful garden. The voice said, This is the garden of peace. You may go in, but you may never leave the garden again. Choose between the garden and the jewel. You cannot have both. The traveller wanted to be a rich man. So he took the jewel, and the garden disappeared. The traveller tried to find the path out of the maze, but he got lost. Night fell. The creatures of the night came out of the ground. They had no eyes, but they could smell the traveller. They had sharp teeth and claws. They were hungry for flesh and blood. The traveller ran along the dark pathways. The night creatures followed him. All night the traveller ran through the maze. All night the creatures followed him. In the morning the night creatures disappeared back into the ground. Daylight came, but no sun. A thick white mist covered the maze. The tired traveller walked round the maze. At last he came to the gate. The gate was locked. Above the gate there was a sign. No man may go out of this gate unless another man comes in. The traveller called through the gate to the people outside. Come in and let me out. I know the secret of the maze. I have the jewel. Come in here and I will make you rich. But no one came. Humphreys put the book down and fell asleep. He started to dream. He was afraid. He was not in his bed. He was standing inside a gate. He was holding something in his hand. It was hot and red. It shone with a red light. There was a white mist all around him. He was calling out loudly, Help me! Help me! Open the gate! A face appeared at the gate. He thought he knew the person's face. The person smiled. He was opening the gate. Humphreys felt happy. Free, he thought, free at last. Then he looked at the man who was opening the gate. He knew the man's face. It was himself. No, no, Humphreys cried out and woke up. He was on the floor beside his bed. The book he had been reading was gone. It was never found again. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. After breakfast, Humphreys took some paper and a pen. He went out into the garden. I will draw a plan of the maze, he said to himself. Once again he walked straight to the centre of the maze. He did not get lost. The gardeners had done their job well. The pathways were clear. The gardeners had also cleaned the metal globe. Humphreys looked at the globe carefully. A strange creature was drawn round the centre of the globe. The words Umbra Mortis, the shadow of death, were written below the creature. The creature was eating its own tail. Above the creature was a man with wings. The man's head was hidden by a ring at the top of the globe. Around the ring was written Princeps Tenebrarum, the Prince of Darkness. The globe was very strange. 
perhaps old Mr. Wilson had brought it back from Italy. Humphreys knocked on the metal globe with his hand. The metal did not seem very thick. The globe sounded hollow. Humphreys was surprised. The globe was hot. It burnt his hand. Was something burning inside the metal globe? He walked away from the globe. He started to draw a plan of the maze. It was difficult, and he made mistakes. Then it started to rain. Humphreys stopped drawing and went back to the house. In the afternoon, the rain stopped. Soon after lunch, Lady Wardrop arrived. It is very kind of you to let me see your gardens, Lady Wardrop said. Tell me, do you have a plan of your maze? I started to draw one this morning, Humphreys said. Oh, good, Lady Wardrop said. Could you let me have a copy for my book? Lady Wardrop talked about gardens. She had visited all the famous gardens in England. Humphreys listened politely and led her to the entrance of the maze. Do you know the way to the centre of the maze? asked Lady Wardrop. Certainly, said Humphreys. Please follow me. They walked around inside the maze for a quarter of an hour. They walked round and round in circles. Mr. Humphreys could not find the centre of the maze. I am very sorry, Lady Wardrop, he said. I was sure I knew the way. I, I've walked to the centre twice before without making a mistake. Lady Wardrop was hot and red in the face. I've seen many mazes, she said, but not one like this. It makes me feel strange. Why? Humphreys asked. Look, said Lady Wardrop, pointing to a tree. Here's my handkerchief. We came along here five minutes ago. I put my handkerchief on a tree on the right-hand side of the path. Now we've come this way again, but my handkerchief is on the left-hand side. That's because we've come from the other direction, Humphreys said. I'm not so sure, Lady Wardrop said. Also, have you noticed those holes in the ground? There is one on the left-hand side of each corner. Those are probably where the stone blocks came from, said Humphreys. We're near the gate. Shall we leave the maze and I'll show you the stone blocks? He took Lady Wardrop to the Roman temple. He showed her the stone blocks. Mr. Wilson took them out of the maze, he said. Each block has a letter cut into it. That is probably the answer to the puzzle of the maze, said Lady Wardrop. Put the letters together and they will spell words. When the stones were in their holes, you followed the words to find the centre of the maze. But of course, you had to know the words. That was the secret. Aha! Very simple, said Humphreys as they walked back to the house. I will let you have a plan of the maze very soon. Thank you very much, said Lady Wardrop. Use string. String? What do you mean? Humphreys asked. Tie a ball of string to the gate, said Lady Wardrop. Take the ball of string with you as you go through the maze. Then you can't get lost. What a good idea, said Humphreys. Humphreys went to bed early, but did not read. He did not want any more bad dreams. He looked out of the window. He remembered the yew tree growing near the house. But he was mistaken. There was no yew tree. He looked all around. The only yew tree he could see was outside the library. He had not seen it before. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want. The next morning, he took paper and pencils and a ball of string into the gardens. He walked straight to the centre of the maze. How did I get lost yesterday? he asked himself. He tied the ball of string to the metal globe. Then he walked back to the gate carrying the ball of string. The string went from the centre of the maze to the entrance. Now it was easy to draw a plan, but it took him all day. He finished in the late afternoon and went back to the house for tea. There was a note from Lady Wardrop. The 16th of August. Dear Mr Humphreys, thank you for showing me the maze. You won't forget to give me a plan, will you? Have you looked underneath the stone blocks? Have they got numbers on them? Yours sincerely, Lady Wardrop. Humphreys decided to look at the stone blocks again the next day. The evening was very hot. He opened all the windows. 
That yew tree outside the library window will have to be cut down. He thought. It shuts out the light, and the branches are growing everywhere. Some of them are coming into the room. He sat down and started to draw the plan of the maze. He worked until nearly midnight. From time to time, he looked at the window. He thought that there was someone outside. He felt someone was waiting to come in, but there was no one there. It was only the yew tree. He drew the last lines of his plan. As he finished, he saw a black mark on the paper in the center of the plan. He looked at the mark, but it was not a mark on the paper. It was a hole. Humphreys saw the black hole becoming larger and larger. He looked down into the hole. There was something at the bottom of the hole. Something was coming up and up. Humphreys could not move. He looked at the thing that was coming nearer and nearer. It was grey and black. It was a ball with two holes for eyes. It came nearer, and Humphreys saw a face. It was a horribly burnt face. The thing reached out two black arms to pull Humphreys down into the hole. Humphreys screamed. He threw himself backwards. He tried to get away from the burnt face and arms. He cried out as he hit his head on the wall. Then everything went black. A doctor came to see Mr. Humphreys. Mr. Humphreys needs a long rest, the doctor told Mr. Cooper. He is speaking very strangely. He is talking about some stones in a Roman temple. He wants you to go and look at them. He wants to know if there are numbers on them. Mr. Humphreys wants to know if the letters on the blocks. Spell words. Also, he wants you to open the metal globe in the centre of the maze. The doctor went on. After that, he wants you to cut down the maze and burn the trees. Lady Wardrop came to the house when she heard of Mr. Humphrey's illness. The gardeners were busy cutting down the maze and burning the yew trees. Cooper came up to her and said, "Excuse me, Lady Wardrop, but we've got two strange things here." Shall I show them to Mister Humphreys? Let me see them," said Lady Wardrop. The first thing was a broken metal globe. Inside the globe was the burnt body of a man. We think it's the body of old Mister Wilson," said Cooper. "We never found out where he was buried." The second thing which Cooper showed Lady Wardrop was a row of stone blocks. They were outside the Roman temple. There was a number on the bottom of each block," said Cooper. "I put them in order. I'm afraid I don't know much Latin, Lady Wardrop. Can you tell us what it means?" The words on the blocks said, "Penetrans ad interiora mortis." I think it means, "The path to the centre of death," said Lady Wardrop. The picture sequence from the cinema has finished. You can look at it once more if you want.